Welcome in, Hunt Palmer, Matt Musso. That can only mean one thing. Baseball is very, very, very close. You feel that, Musso? I feel that. <laughs> Man, do I feel that. I, I've been ready since June 27th uh -huh. when they got back to Baton Rouge with a trophy. Well, uh, we've gotten some asks uh, on Twitter and, and on the chat on, on our shows. Like, hey, are y'all going to talk baseball again before the season? You did a season preview last year. That tended to work out pretty well. Did. Uh, they won the whole thing. Uh, so we'll do it again. I don't know if there's any superstition involved. But we're back. And then baseball at the box is right around the corner. So uh, let's get into it. I want to start with kind of a summation of last year. I, 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 I want to compare it to 2009 because they were preseason number one mm -hmm. and they ended up winning it in, at the end in game three. And in that way, it was the same. But this was maybe even more special because of the amount of star power that they had, the amount of star power that even developed with Paul Skeens, which we didn't know at this point last year what Paul Skeens was. I was openly a little bit skeptical because the numbers at Air Force weren't jaw-dropping. But to go on that ride when it was expected to be that ride, and expectation breeds disappointment, was amazing and I said this on my show the day of game three and I stood by it like they should have won it they deserve to have won it they played the best all year long they had a two-week hiccup and when the postseason came around they were ready to roll and it was a uh it was not a great game too but game three was everything we wanted and they got it done and they went through the best teams to get there yep. too I mean you know you you beat a top five Arkansas team at home in a series you beat Florida in the national championship. You beat Wake Forest, who, if it wasn't LSU, who was looked upon as the best team all year, it, it was it was the Demon Deacons. So you beat Tennessee, what, four times that year? So, I mean, last year. So you, you went through the best to get there. I'm probably leaving somebody out. Uh, well, but, Tennessee and Wake were the top two ERAs in the country, yeah. and, and Florida was probably the number two team in the country behind Wake Forest. And uh, you, you it, rarely in this sport, are the last three teams, the best yeah. three teams in the country. That was the case, and LSU stood the tallest. And to your point with the expectation, I mean, they were labeled literally back in June of 2022 yep. when they started, you know, going through the transfer portal and Jay just cherry-picking basically whoever he wanted, it felt like. At that point, they were labeled the most talented team in program history. So, I mean, yeah, they had that weight on them and the weight of, you got to go win a national championship, you're number one, and, and they did it, and I mean, 54 games, wins, that's that's damn impressive. It was uh, it was very fun. However, a little bit of cold water here uh, as we get to opening day. 59% uh, of your hits are gone. 59% yep. of your home runs are gone. 55% yep. of your RBI are gone. 53% of your runs scored are gone. If you go to the box score from the Game 3 of the National Final... Uh, you've lost your leadoff hitter, which was actually Cade Beloso that day on a it little was. bit of a whim. Um, you lost your two-hole hitter from that day. That was Dylan Cruz. You lost your cleanup hitter in Trey Morgan. You lost your five-hole hitter in Gavin Dugas. You lost your six-hole hitter in Braden Joubert. You lost your seven-hole hitter in Jordan Thompson. You bring back the guy who hit third that day, which was Tommy White. You bring back your eight and nine holes, which were Pearson and Malazzo. So there is a significant portion of this team that is turned over offensively. Your concern level is where? Um, you would do like scale one to ten. Yeah. Okay. Concern level for the offense scale one to ten. I I will go six okay. right now. I I want. I was gonna say seven, but I thought that might be a little too high because I do think Hayden Travinsky wasn't in the lineup that day. Right. But Hayden Travinsky was gangbusters for you down the stretch. Really starting in that old Miss series when he hit the you know well not a walk off but the go ahead two run homer in the ninth inning. On the guy ended up with ten homer double digit home runs. He's been great in the preseason and, and in the fall. You expect him to to hit well. He's fully healthy, finally, in his career. I like what you probably have in Travinsky. Paxton Kling has looked really, really good in all the scrimmages. You expect him to take that next step. Josh Pearson, you will have back, albeit at second base, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get to that. Yes. But a guy who has produced and been through the battles, so I like that. Where my concern level falls in is, if you want a specific guy, Jared Jones, which, mm -hmm. again, I'm sure we'll get deeper into and to how they stack it, who protects Tommy White. Because when, one of the things I look at from last year is Tommy White having 105 RBI, which is insane. He was the first guy in the program to have 100 RBI since Brad Cressy. Like, it's, it's, it just doesn't happen in college baseball. He's not going to have that this year because he's not going to be hitting behind Dylan Cruz and Gavin Dugas and Trey Morgan. Those guys are gone. So who can you put in front of him that can produce to where he is up in that spot? That's really where my concern level comes to. I think they're going to hit the ball over the fence. I think they're going to be able to manufacture runs, but can they do it at at a rate that can have them competing at the top of the Southeastern Conference? That's going to be the question. So 
I say six because I think you have guys that can fill that role. I just have to see it. And if you do, if they can, you're going to be really good again. I think that's fair on six um, because it, there's a sliding scale there. If you're comparing them to the 64 teams that will make the NCAA yeah. tournament, they're a very, very good offense. If you're comparing them to what it takes to win a national championship, which is it's the bar here. It was It's always the bar here. Um, then all of a sudden, the questions start to creep in about who's going to step forward and fill some of the roles that you said. Um, let's just keep it between the rails and kind of go position by position like we did on this deal last year. And we'll start at catcher. Um, and, and I want to start with Stravinsky, even though I don't think he'll be the catcher mm -hmm. on opening day, because you mentioned him there. And that may be a spot in the order that I'm underselling a little bit because um, he was excellent last year and probably better than I thought once he entered the lineup. He hit a home run in five straight SEC games in limited playing time, albeit it was he only started eight SEC games, yeah. only played in 13 SEC games. He did hit 351. He hit nearly 500 in the regional. Um, he hit for power in limited at bats. And I think while he was drowning for two years behind Morgan and Cruz and Thompson and all those guys, Jacob Berry and Tommy White, and, and you, you brought in Brady Neal, who was playing like he, he was buried under. It's not that he was not productive. He didn't play. He <laughs> did play last year. And maybe he is a 330, 17 home run guy. Like maybe that's who he is. And all of a sudden, you put that up there with Tommy White, oh, yeah. and that makes a lot more sense. I, that That's not something maybe I was thinking about three weeks ago, but as I started to look into box score, started to look into highlights, started to go and, and watch the team play post-New Year, maybe he's a, a huge bat that is not necessarily a guy that we don't know anything about, like a, a transfer or a, a freshman, but he can, can grow into a star. Yeah, and I mean, I think you I think you see a lot of guys like Hayden Travinsky in college baseball who are looked upon as this big hulking power hitter and maybe can can struggle and go through lulls and go through, you know, a struggle with maybe some secondary stuff. The guy, the home run he hit against Ole Miss, it was a hanging curveball. Yes. Uh, the home run he hit against Alabama, he turned around like a 97 mile per hour fastball. Like it wasn't it wasn't him just feasting, getting a, getting ahead in the count and feasting on pitches. He he was kind of doing it all and then towards the end, it, he he went into a little bit of a lull. That's going to happen occasionally and you know, you, you went with Malazzo behind the plate a lot late in the season, too. But you brought up the five straight games of the homers in the SEC play. Out of 10, I mean, half his home runs were more than half. Really, because he hit six total in the SEC play were against the best pitching in the country. So that that's encouraging to me when I look at that. Yeah, I mean, I you're talking to me preseason. I would tell you, I think Hayden Jarensky can be a 17-homer, 20-homer guy for you this year. In the SEC, they'll play 30 games. How many of those does Brady Neal catch? 20 I, I, I yeah I, I he's he's just your most he's your most complete catcher offensively and, and defensively like he's the guy that can do it both pretty well I mean I think we all have to remember too he reclassified he should have been someone in yeah. high school last year and and he's on the number one team in the country and his starting catcher from day one had a massive the moment wasn't too big had a massive home run against Arkansas Hagan Smith against Hagan Arkansas, Smith, yeah, Hagen Hagen Smith who, who by will, the way is throwing 100 now he'll which, be the best left-handed pitcher in the league this no year. thank you um does that in the eighth inning to tie the game so yeah I mean I I malazzo has got a spot on this team and I know we're going to get to him but for me yeah. it's it's got to be the Brady Neal show if he's healthy and he looks really really healthy right now he hit two home runs in SEC play last year they were against Hagan Smith who's going to be a top 10 pick and the yeah. best pitcher in the league this year and the other one was against Chase who, Burns yeah uh, so, and that was a hanging breaking ball. Yes, but he crushed it. Um, and but but that said, he also in limited SEC play only played eleven games. Was five for thirty two. Yeah. He did not hit a lot last year as someone who was supposed to be a senior in high school. He went up to Cape Cod and got a couple of games in. The back barked at him again. He came back. Didn't play very much um, in the fall. He's they've eased him back in the spring. He's the, the most talented catcher that they have. Um, I'm just curious to see how much they lean on him. You said twenty SEC games. That would surprise me if it was that high, but I okay. would love that because maybe he grows into, we're told, we always talk about these sophomores have got to step up and be stars, and if he's one of those guys, that's that's fantastic, and that leaves you with Malazzo, who was functional offensively last For year. For sure, 289. I mean, he yeah. hit 289, used the backside of the field a lot better. I mean, it's you could start to see it in Jay's first year before Malazzo got hurt. I mean, he, I mean, I, I get it. It was I think it was like two, I mean, I could get it, but I think it was like 234. 225 or something like that, but it was up from 135 the year prior. So it's a it's a big jump. You could you were starting to see it, and 
he had some clutch hits for you last year too. And I mean, the defense is there. For me, if it's not Brady Neal, it's got to be Alex Malazzo. You mentioned Jared Jones as somebody that you're um, got a little bit of of concern with. If, if I'm being too stern there, then then tell me. But he's going to be the opening day first baseman. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, well, defensively, I think he'll be fine at first base. That that doesn't worry me. I thought he was really good there last year. He, I mean, that's the only place you really saw him start a game other than DH. And I mean, he fielded like nine eighty nine or something like that, nine eighty seven, I think. Um, so that that part doesn't concern me. What concerns me is can he hit a breaking ball? And so far. Um, the answer has been not really, um, that, that was his undoing last year when you got into sec play, uh, deep into sec play, I should say. And it took him out of the lineup and he never really got his way back into it. Um, it's, it's been a lot of there's, the strikeout numbers really high and the strikeout numbers probably always going to be high with him. He just seems to be that, that guy. Uh, I mean, he did still hit over 300 last year and had 14 homers, but the strikeout number is is the concerning part specifically on the breaking ball. He was a 26% strikeout guy in SEC play last year, which is not egregiously no. awful. Um, but if it was closer to 20, I would like that. And I'll take a 20%, 23% strikeout guy if you're going to get big slug and 100%. big contact. We know it's in there. The question is, can he can he harness it? And, it, and for me, for, with him, it's not bat to ball. It's pitch recognition. Mm -hmm. It's being fooled. It's chasing the breaking ball that's out of the strike zone, and then it's taking the one that that buckles you, either whether it's a back door or or off the front hip. Like, and that's what guys are going to throw him. And like, he can catch up to the fastball. You're not worried about that. He's just got to see the breaking ball, and if he can identify it and just lay off of it some, <laughs> he'll get himself into fastball counts. There's a concern there, and who's next for you if if Jerry Jones just simply can't 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 make enough contact? So that's a great question, and the guys I've seen them play most at first base that aren't Jared Jones is freshman Jake Brown mm -hmm. and freshman Ashton Larson, yes. who came here as an outfielder yep. and a very good one. He's left-handed, uh, so hey, first, hey, first base, first grab base. Exactly. Uh, so, I mean, I, I would think one of those guys, I know we've kind of talked about this before, if you do move Jared Jones and you do go to a guy like Larson or Jake Brown, that potentially doesn't just upset one spot on your team. It upsets two because Jake Brown very likely is going to start in the outfield for you from day one. And if you know if you move him, maybe Larson gets the spot in the outfield. If you move Larson, then you don't you have to upset two. But that's the interesting. I'll throw this name out to you, though, Hunt. Ethan Fry. Mm -hmm. And I know they've tried him at first base before, and maybe it hadn't been awesome. It's not poetry it, over there it, when it, he's over there. And that's fine. <laughs> The bat is real, though. Yeah. I mean, the kid hits the cover off the ball. His at-bats are competitive. I like that. I'm not saying he might get first crack if Jared Jones does falter a little bit at the plate. But late in the, like, if we get to the middle of SEC play, it wouldn't surprise me if Ethan Fry does emerge at some point this year. But I would, in the immediacy, I'd probably say Jake Brown is the guy they would go to there. I think that's possible. And we'll talk about him when we, we go to the outfield. Brown's just a really, really good yeah, athlete like who I would just, at this time last year, I thought just Jake Brown was just a left-handed pitcher. turns out he's me too. He's a lot more. Um, and, and like, there's a lot of pitchers that come to LSU that hit the cover off the ball in high school. Ryan Eads was a great high school mm -hmm. hitter that never grabbed a bat at LSU. Like that's kind of where the end of the road usually lands, but uh, not for him. He's turned into a an outfielder and potentially a first baseman on this team. Can Josh Pearson play second base? I think so. I think he can. Um, I've seen now, with the caveat, that been out there a little bit more than a handful of times through fall and preseason. I've seen him field one baseball. Yes. Uh, but he made the play fine. Like The out was recorded in plenty of time. I will say this. I will use two examples. Jared Foster played first base, second base at LSU. Mm -hmm. He spent his entire career as an outfielder before that. They needed his bat, and he was more than serviceable on a team in 2015 that was number one in the country for the most of the year, won the SEC, and could have won the national championship. A lot of people would say should have. So that's one example. Austin Bain also played second base. He did. And led the SEC in doubles. He was a pitcher. So, I mean, yes, I think it's, it's not of the two middle infield positions. It's not as premium as shortstop. You want to be strong up the middle, but you can, in a sense, hide a guy at second base. But I think... Pearson's a good enough athlete that he can handle the position well. I mean, Gavin Dugas is another example. Dugas. That. Ja Jacoby Jones came from the infield yep. to outfield back into the infield. So it's 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 it happens at second base. And uh, if you can find a bat, you can find a bat. The word that comes up with Pearson every time Jay talks about him in front of a microphone 
is trust. He yep. says it every time, and it pays off in Omaha when he's hitting balls against Florida into the, the right field bleachers and in the national final. Catching I mean, the ball with the sun yeah. directly in his face. Yeah, that was big play, too. I mean, his numbers last year were not very good, um, and, and we kind of expected that this time last year because he wasn't hitting at all. He hadn't hit since, since Hattiesburg when they left the field after losing the regional. He hit 246 in SEC play last year, and for the season, Pearson hit 226 uh, with only four home runs, but he had some big, big hits, and hopefully he's a little more consistent this year. Um, I'll be quite honest with you, shortstop. When the Michael Braswell uh, transfer was announced and LSU was in Omaha, um, that was not a name I was super familiar with. I have a pretty good handle on the SEC. I didn't that name didn't pop to me, so I went and looked and I looked at the statistics and I said, mm-hmm. "That is not Jacob Berry. That is not Tommy White. <laughs> that is not that's not what I thought I was looking for for a middle infielder out of the transfer portal." Um, I was very skeptical of that addition. He's been really good. Since he showed up, every scrimmage, every time out, um, the defense has been very, very strong, and he's really swung the bat. He's been so his progression at South Carolina, his batting average was better as a freshman, <laughs> but his on base was significantly better as a sophomore. He walked at a significantly higher rate with far fewer at bats, and that's the number that I'm looking for with him. I, I don't think you're going to get much power out of him. He's hit three home runs in three years. Um, I, I just don't think you're going to get a lot of power. But if you can get quality defense at shortstop, an on base of around 365, 375, that's fine. I mean, I would love to have Brandon Larson playing shortstop and hitting 40 home runs. That'd be awesome. Um, but I, I think that's good. And I feel better about him today than I did last June when he announced he was coming to LSU. I, I like Michael Braswell a lot. The, I mean, the gloves elite. Uh, even Jay uh, at Media Day said that. The, the two things that really stuck out to me when when Jay was talking about Bra- Michael Braswell at Media Day, number one, he said he's here because I wanted him here, which that's an extreme vote of confidence from the head coach already. I, I mean, I don't know how that doesn't fire you up. And then two, that he's better defensively than he thought. And again, the work's coming at the plate. I, I That was my main concern was because I, I remember watching him against LSU uh, at South Carolina and him – you know, just fielding everything uh, out there. So I'm like, okay, well, I know the glove's good. The bat lacked. But the first at bat, he took the first at bat in the first scrimmage in fall, and he lined a ball up the middle, then hit a home run later. And I was like, okay. Then he would lead the team in hitting in the fall. And I've I've been out there again, like I said, more than a little bit more than a handful of times. I've seen him fail to get a hit one time. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the bat is, is going to be there. I'm with you. His freshman batting average was 289. If he gives LSU 289 this year at shortstop and fields, you know, 980, whatever, okay, I'm perfectly fine with that, and he's going to have a spot there for a long time. They went him. They went and got him to play shortstop, and he's going to do that for LSU. He is. I've seen a couple doubles from him down the left yep. field line. Uh, he's fine hitting the ball to the backside of the field as well. He's, again, not a guy that's going to hit third for you and, and be – I don't think he's going to be an all-SEC shortstop, but can he be a, a quality piece to the team? I think absolutely. Um, Tommy White, I, I don't think we have to say too much about him <laughs> other than he's healthy. Who? What? Uh, where do you think he hits second, third, fourth, and who's around him? What makes sense yeah, there? Because we don't have to talk about what the production is. He's he's a superstar. Yeah, I mean, that that's that's the main question with Tommy. It goes back to what we said earlier where he's, you know, he's not going to have 105 RBI because we don't know who's going to be hitting in front of him or behind him. I think you start uh, probably him at the three-hole in game one. I think you probably have Travinsky behind him. Um, I mean, that should at least give and VMI fits. Bingham, Pearson, uh, yeah, in front I mean, I, of him, something I, I, like that. Maybe even Jake Brown. I've seen Jake yeah. Brown in the two hole a yeah. lot. I mean, I, that wouldn't surprise me. Uh, Pearson, I love in the leadoff hole. He's been great in that spot in his career. Paxton Clean is an option for a leadoff hitter. Has been given really competitive at bats. So I think uh, some of those guys. I think if if you had to, you know, if 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 I had to fill out a lineup card right now, I'd give you a top four of Kling, Brown, White, and Travinsky. Kling was the leadoff hitter on opening day last year. He wasn't was. He? That's, he was that's crazy. Um, for the season last year, Kling's on base was 390. It was real low in SEC mm-hmm. play, but he appears to have made some strides. Let's go out to the outfield. Um, we'll kind of lump it all together, left, center, right. It's a combination of of Brown and Kling and Bingham. How do they shuffle that together? We think on opening day. I think you have Bingham in left, Kling in center, and Brown in right. That, that's right. I mean, I, I just I. Kling has looked really, really, really good to me in center field. Going back on the ball, coming in on the ball. I mean, just his his motion is good. And the arm, he really showed the arm off in one of the recent scrimmages. I was having back-to-back innings. He pegged Ryan Kucherak at third base, and it wasn't close. The ball never hit the ground. It just hit White right in the glove, right on the bag. And that was 
He was shaded towards right and about a little deeper than his normal depth that he would play and just fired a laser. And then the next inning pegged Ethan Fry. And I know Ethan Fry is not the best runner in the world, probably you'd say, but again, it was another dart that didn't hit the ground. So I like him as your def a great defensive center fielder for you there in Paxton Kling. Uh, so I'd go Bingham, Kling, Brown. Uh, Bingham's going to be really solid. Um, he's just got too long a track record. The Pac-12 yeah. is not the SEC. It's also not the Church League. Uh, so, I mean, it's for a guy to hit in the 380s out mm -hmm. of the Pac-12 shows that that's, that's a, a, a guy who can handle the bat. I don't think he's going to hit for as much power as Gavin Dugas showed, but I think he's going to give you quality at bats kind of the way that Gavin Dugas did. Gavin only hit 290 last year, but his on-base was 464. Now, no one's going to get hit that much, <laughs> but in terms of walking, getting hit by pitches, and then contributing with some, some singles and doubles, Bingham will probably hit, depending on how many games they play, seven, nine home runs. Um, maybe he runs into a couple more early against some poor pitching. Depends on how the weather is. But I think that's a guy who hits towards the top of the lineup and gets on base a lot. Yeah, I, when I look at Mac Bingham, I wouldn't you know label him as like a real toolsy guy. Nope. He's just... Neither he, do guys. He does everything well. Like, he does every part of the game well. It's not elite. It's not going to blow you away. It's just he's solid. He's that guy. Dugas is a great comparison for him. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about him. And look, uh, Arizona transfers have worked out pretty well for LSU <laughs> lately. So, uh, no pressure, Mac Bingham. No pressure. Uh, is there anybody else that you think could crack through in, in the outfield? Ethan Fry is a name that, that absolutely comes up. Is there is there somebody else that maybe can, can find their way? Because every year, you look back at the opening day lineup and go, I can't believe that, that guy wasn't yeah. in there or that guy was in there. Yeah, I mean, just off potential, I mean, Ashton Larson, I think, is yeah. the name you have to, I mean, he was a top 100 guy out of high school and a top 20 outfielder in the country, number one player in his state. So, I mean, a career like 350 hitter in, in high school ball, hit 400 his last year. So, I mean, I, when you look at the sheer potential and a you standout freshman, potentially him, and then Ethan Fry. I mean, e Ethan Fry is my guy for just in general that I think could, could break into this lineup at some point because I feel like you just have to get him at bats. And if you get him consistent at bats, he's going to hit the ball. And then you figure out, uh, where to place him. So Larson for the outfield, Fry maybe for the whole thing. And I've got one more name that I'll toss in that's not an outfielder, he's an infielder, but that that could make his way in and, and become a staple. And that's that's uh, Stephen Milam. Yes. Um, now Stephen Milam was one of the, the crown jewels of this class from a position player perspective. Um, was a draft risk, but he's small. So that mm -hmm. helps you from a college perspective. He's a switch hitter. Um, he's got a really flat, short stroke that even for a guy who's, what, 5'7", yep. uh, there's a little pop in there, especially from the left side. And he looks really good taking infield. He struggled making the routine play in the fall. Um, when he makes the play, you're like, oh, that guy's so smooth. He's got the, the smooth arm action and the great hands. And then you see him kick a couple around. There's there's some progression that needs to go on. And when I was looking at him in the fall, I was going, that, that can't be your shortstop. Uh, but Braswell's taken that, so you don't have to worry about it. They're going to ease him in and, and find some at-bats for him, I think, early. They play eight games in the first ten days, which is yeah. we'll talk more about with the pitching because you're going to have so many guys that have to eat innings that we'll, we'll see a lot of those guys in the first week and a half. But I think Milam will get some at-bats, and that's a guy that I could absolutely see wrestling a spot away. If you've got somebody struggling in the outfield or you have an injury and you need Pearson to go back out there, I think Milam could very well fit in at uh, at second base. For sure. I'm very high on him as well. And, yeah, I mean, I, I think they had eyes. I don't think. I know they had eyes on him being a starting infielder as a freshman here. And it just, it. you're right, the routine play was a problem. But in, you mentioned the switch hitting thing. He's a legit switch hitter. Like They need left-handed bats. Like, they're, they just don't have very many of them. Yeah, and he's a le legit, like, he's good from both sides of the plate. If you could find a lineup that had Brady Neal in there, who's left-handed, that had Milam in there, who would hit left-handed against right-handers, that had Pearson in there, mm -hmm. and then it had Jake Brown in there, all of a sudden it balances more than it did back in, well, in like... Oh, Kling's uh, right. Kling's right. right. I'm on, sorry, Kling is right-handed. It's all good. Uh, but on the, on the, um, yeah, golly, man. Uh, but uh, back in, in July, when I'm starting to look at this roster, I'm going... Well, I don't know if Neil's going to play because he hadn't played all summer and all fall, and I didn't know break Jake Brown hit at all, and I don't know if Milan's <laughs> going to make it to campus. And I'm going, they don't have anybody that's left-handed. It's it's Pearson, and that's basically it. There are a few more options now that are materializing. They, of course, had a, a ton of left-handed options last year. So last year at this time, we're looking at this LSU offense, and we're going, they've got more dudes than room on the field. And then we looked at the pitching staff, and you're going, I don't know what that looks like. This time you flip it, and you look at the, the offense, and you're going, I don't know who fills all these spots. They're going to have to figure it out at some places. And then you look at 
the pitching staff and you go, I don't know how they have room for all these dudes. <laughs> like they yeah. got they got pitching in in spades, and that's in my opinion going to need to carry them early. For sure, and and again, you know what? I can I can tie that back into into our offensive question when we were given like the scale of one to ten, and that's another reason I I'm not as worried early about the offense because I I think LSU has that pitching staff this year that can win them a three to two game, a three to one game where maybe the offense has a down day and that's all you need because you've got arms for days. And I mean, I know we're gonna get all into it, but what? It's at each level, the back end, and the thing that really stands out is the starting pitching this year. It's 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 something that LSU LSU has the potential to have this year, where they have not had since 2017, where you could have three legitimate starters. And I mean, Jay, the first year, I mean, he had Mikhail Hilliard on Friday night and pieced it together after that. Paul Skeens, Ty Floyd was a bit inconsistent, but when he was good, it was really really good last year. And you you waited for Thatcher Hurd to emerge late. This year, you're set up to be able to go starting pitching, middle relief, and at the back end of your bullpen on start, paper. Yeah, we'll start with the starters. Um, Thatcher Hurd's numbers from last year don't look great, specifically from an ERA perspective. His ERA was 5.68 for the season. Um, there were two disasters in there. Mm-hmm. He started game three against Tennessee and did not record an out and gave up six earned runs. Uh, I was at that game with my dad, Me too. and that was just such a – you just can't even get excited. You're down 6 nothing before you recorded an out. Um, they were going for a sweep that day. It didn't happen. So that that's a disaster, You're giving up six earned runs without getting an out, and he was part of the meltdown against Mississippi State where he also did not record an out and gave up five earned runs in that one. So that's 11 earned runs without giving up a single – without getting a single out in those two. But if you start to look a little bit more closely – he was excellent in the finale series at Georgia uh, where he pitched the last five innings of that mm-hmm. extra inning win. He was great there. I thought he was sensational in that five-inning stint in the regional after the rain came. Ty Floyd had to sit oh, yeah. down against Oregon State. Uh, he had seven strikeouts in five innings against Oregon State in the game that LSU had to win, and they won 6-5. to five. And then, obviously, he was great against Wake Forest in two different three-inning stints. Um, in two different three-inning stints, he only gave up one earned run over six innings against Wake, and then we know what he did in the championship game against Florida, six innings. He's got A stuff. He's got first-round stuff, and I'm not really concerned about the fact that Thatcher Hurd's ERA was 5.68. I think he can win you games. It used to say Fridays. They now play on Thursday a bunch, but sure. in game ones of the SEC where I think he's going to pitch, he can get you some outs. Yeah, this is where I view Thatcher Hurd. So remember last year at this time when Jay Johnson said Thatcher Hurd's going to have to pitch in – in the biggest moments for us if we want to get to where we're going to go. And ultimately, that was prophetic. I mean, the guy got the win in the national championship final. Uh, for that reason, it doesn't matter to me where Thatcher Hurd pitches in the rotation. He's going to be your ace he, because he's the guy who's been through the battles. I know Luke Coleman pitched on Friday nights last year. That's great. Thatcher Hurd started a national championship. game. Like He has been through the battles. When you need that win, when you need that, he's the guy you're going to want to give the ball to this year. The stuff seems to have taken a jump. I mean, the fastball is more consistently at 97, uh, touching a 98 this year, which is great to see. Um, again, same thing kind of with Gage Jump. He hadn't pitched in a year. The stuff's great, but he hadn't pitched in a year. Thatcher Hurd's going to be that guy that they want to give the ball to in the biggest moment this year. So, again, he can pitch game one. He can pitch game two. It doesn't matter to me. He is the eight. He's looked upon as the ace of this staff because he's been through those wars. I think he'll pitch uh, in the opener on Friday. We'll just We'll just have to see. Uh, Luke Coleman will be the next name we want to talk about. Here's how I feel about Luke Coleman. Um, And this sounds like a negative. I'm really not attempting to be negative. Uh, If Luke Coleman is your ace, I think that's okay. Uh, If Luke Coleman is your number two or number three, I think that feels really good. I don't know that I want Luke Coleman going against every SEC ace and pitching the marble game of the regional and, and starting game one in Omaha. Like That's not exactly where I have him. If he, if he blossoms into the talent's there, he's going to be a first or second round pick, um, so it sounds ridiculous. I got a little bit more confidence in Hurd in that spot, mm-hmm. but I do feel really good with Luke Coleman going out there in game two or game three of an SEC series. More importantly, down the road, you want to pitch him against a four seed at the box? I feel great about yeah. his ability to go out there. He did that against Nichols in in the uh, in the regional last year through six innings of two-run baseball. That's that's really good. He pitched game one of that super against Wake and was pretty good. But I would also feel good if we're going Thatcher Hurd um, in a game one 
and maybe Gage jump in a game two in Omaha, and maybe you've lost one of those games, and you send Luke Holman out there in a game three, mm -hmm. that's not a terrible spot to be in. That beats, where honestly, where LSU was trying to throw Nate Ackenhausen out there last year, which worked out brilliantly, we know, but that's <laughs> that's hindsight. Like I think Luke Holman is a very, very good SEC pitcher. I don't want him to be the ace. I just feel good about where he slots in with that stuff in in those kind of situations. I like his temperament a lot. And and I and I say that in in this vein. I always throw this caveat out there when everyone brings up, you know, I mean, he pitched on Friday nights for Alabama last year. Yes, and that was out of necessity because yeah. Ben Hess got hurt and then Grayson Hitt got hurt and Luke Holman started as their midweek guy, but it didn't phase him. And that would phase some people. And the game that stands out to me most, it was a Thursday night game. I watched the entire thing. It was the week after the LSU fiasco where he was scratched and all that. He comes back against Vanderbilt and throws seven innings of two-run two, two run ball. He gave up a solo homer in the first and never looked back. Struck out seven, only gave up two earned runs, pitched into the sixth against Florida in the SEC tournament. Struck out eight and six in five-plus innings against Wake Forest. Like, he really came into his own in a spot that he was forced into, and it didn't face him. So I, I love that type of temperament from a guy like that. I think whenever I say... Yeah, he was put there out of necessity. That can also sound like a negative. I don't mean it in that way at all because he took something that would affect others and didn't let it affect him and got better over the course of the season for an Alabama team that made a run to a Super Regional. So I'm very excited about Holman. And I know, yeah, I mean, they they are very high on him too. In two of those midweek games early in his uh, in the time against Sanford and South Alabama, a total there uh, of 12 innings as a starter in those two weeks, struck out 21. Yeah, how about that? Um, so that's, that's pretty salty against some lower-level competition on the midweek. But 91, 92, 93, 94 with a fastball and definitely has uh, two breaking pitches that he can throw at you as well. Tell me about Gage Jump. Man, I like Gage Jump a lot. I mean, arguably the best stuff on the staff. Potentially, he just hadn't pitched in a year. I yep. mean, that's that's the thing. He, on media day, said that he's feeling great. I mean, you talk about four pitches, all for strikes, pounds the zone, mid-90s from the left side. I mean, he's if you concoct the perfect left-handed pitcher in a lab, you normally get a guy like Gage Jump. It's That's what it feels like. Led the team in batting average against in the fall. Led the team in whip uh, in the fall. I mean, he's he has shown up. And been very, very well. I like the way they've brought him along, too. It's been slowly, but with an eye to being able to have him potentially in the rotation day one. So I'm expecting huge things from Gage Jump. I had uh, my annual conversation with a couple people inside the staff as I'm kind of getting ready for the uh, for the season, kind of doing some digging. And I was told, I think he's the best pitcher on the staff yeah. um, from inside the building. So that's uh, that's very, very exciting. Um, there's a chance that could be your ace. Uh, yeah. We've talked about that. You heard we talk about Holman. Either way, you, you Take those guys and you toss them in on a weekend. You should feel very, very good about. It. Is there another name to watch that could be starting by Easter? They're they're in the weekend rotation because of an in injury or, or something falters. Is there a, another name? I I would struggle, but yeah, I mean that's the thing. I, I I don't I don't think it's any of the young guys. That's that's the thing. I, I think it would probably be like a guy like like Nate Ackenhausen or Javen Coleman. J Javen Coleman would be my answer. Um, and then Ackenhausen. I know a lot of people listening to this probably wanted to hear Cam Johnson or yep. something like that. Yeah. But and we're going to get to him, so I won't go too deep. But I, I don't think that's his role yet at LSU. Uh, he'll have a role, but I don't think that's his role yet. So I would go Coleman and then Ackenhausen. Let's go to the bullpen then. And I want to play a little bit of a game here with you. Um, LSU has a, a one run lead in the eighth inning of an SEC game. Tell me yes or no. You feel really confident with this guy on the mound, Griffin Herring? Yes. Nate Ackenhausen? Yes. Justin Lore? Yeah. Cam Johnson? Yes. Okay. Javen Coleman. Yeah. Cade Anderson. Mm, not yet. Nick Bronzini. No. DJ Primo. Yes. Okay. That's six left-handers. You said you'd feel good about in a, in a one-run SEC game in the eighth. Let's go to the right side. Gavin Gidry. Yeah. Cade Woods. Y yeah. Christian Little. Not yet. Aiden Moffat. Not yet. Sam Dutton. Not yet. Will Helmers. No. Micah Bucknam. No. Fidel U U Uyoa. Uyoa. I wrote yes. down the phonetic thing. Uyoa. Yes. Yes. That's, yes. Uh, Jaden Newt when healthy. I guess you can't really say it right now. Yeah. I mean, so that was TBA. six six left handers and three right handers. That's the inverse of everything we've ever <laughs> we've ever done. Um, they're very left handed. Um, and you know, you're going off. I guess those three right handers would have been 
Uyoa, Gidry, and, and Woods, and we think there's a chance Gidry's toward the back end. So mm-hmm. the middle innings are going to be dominated from LSU's perspective by by left-handed arms for sure. And I and I don't mean I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I left-handed pitch. I mean I don't know. Everyone always says oh they throw it the wrong hand. They can just get people out because of that. So I, I don't know. Maybe maybe I fall into the cliches a little bit too much with with lefties, but. I think what they have, yeah, it's a lot of lefties, but it's a lot of really, really, really good plus lefties. That I mean, Justin Lohr looks awesome, man. I mean, that guy, he and he was battle tested, faced some really good tournament teams last year, and pitched well at Xavier. He shut the door on Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt season in Nashville. Uh, got faced the Oregon early in the year. That was a super yeah. regional team. West Virginia was a tournament team. He faced them twice. I mean, so like, I'm really excited about him. Um, yeah, I, I think what they have is really, really good lefties that it might not matter that there's so many of them. Does Javon Coleman take a jump this year? I think so. He looks really healthy. I mean, I've, I've gotten to see him twice in a starting role, and he's been awesome. I mean, he's given up one run in five inning, in five and a third innings that I've seen him pitch so far in the preseason. The fastball's back up to 90, touching 95. It's sitting more 93, 94. But he he looks like he did towards, his, towards the end of his freshman year, quite honestly. So, yeah, I, I do, and I— and the thing that excites me so much about him is I think he's one of your most versatile pitchers. He can do it in any role you want him to. Go start. All right, go chew up three innings in the middle. Okay, go close the game. I, I'm very excited for Javon Coleman this he year. He struck out 21 in 14 innings last year, which surprised me to go back and look at that. Um, it's one of those deals that that coming off of injury, and we got, I'll, I'll briefly touch on Jaden Newt and Chase Shores, and then we'll get back into the guys that are going to be out there for opening day, but when, when you're counting on someone to come back off Tommy John and help, like that's, it's Jake Latz, it's Jamin Coleman. Like it, it's, it's not something Jake I'm comfortable Latz. doing. Well, it's, I mean, that was like two years of that. Uh, um, I'll tell you this on, on Newt and Shores. Chase Shores is not going to pitch this year. Nope. The, the, he's just not. And he, he tore his AC as UCL in the middle of the year last year with Tennessee. They absolutely expect that Jaden Newt will pitch this year. So as I, I was having this discussion, I was like, me personally as a fan and someone who's analyzing this team and talking about them day to day, like, I'm not going to plan for much from Jaden Newt. I'm not going to be like, well, they're getting this guy that could have gone in the second round back midseason. Like, he's going to be a huge, like, if that happens, it's gravy. If it doesn't, fine. And that was, it, it was expressed to me like, yeah, that's probably a fair way to look at it. But they're looking at, at April 1st. And that gives you April and May to ramp up over the course of like seven or eight weeks. So, if there's reason to believe that could be another right-handed guy for him, but we're not going to talk about him right now because we, one, haven't seen him at all because he hasn't pitched sure. since he's been to LSU, and two, because that's a couple months down the road. But um, where do you think some roles may be defined with the guys that we we listed there? Do you have a closer in mind? Do you think they go matchups there? I think it could be matchups. I, I think I think you got two guys who are, are very interchangeable. I mean, if, if if you have Justin Lohr setting up Gavin Gidry, you're going to feel really good. If you have Gavin Gidry setting up Justin Lohr, I think you're going to feel really good. And I think the wild card there could be Cam Johnson as a yeah. back end of the bullpen guy. I mean, I like that's if they, if they don't want him to start midweek games and they want him more on the weekend, the back end of the bullpen is where I see him just as a freshman. Three pitches, fastball up to 98, pretty consistently. That's elite stuff. I mean, we ran through some of this with Gage Jump. I mean, uh, Cam Johnson was second to only Gage Jump and Whip in the fall on this team. He was third in batting average against. And that's his first taste of college baseball ever, y'all. That's that's absurd. Like, he's there's a reason he's the highest prospect to ever make it to campus. You've heard that mm-hmm. over and over again. So I think he could find a role there as well. So, yeah, I think I think you could go matchups. Uh, there we didn't mention Kate Anderson. I think that's a guy who could maybe get a nod to start a midweek game early uh, for this team since they have so many games and so many days like you touched on earlier. He throws a lot of strikes, fastballs up to 94, but he's got that injury history that he's still coming back off of. So, but I I like those two freshman arms a lot. And then you got the versatile guys like Coleman, Ackenhausen, who I think can fill many roles for you. I like Fidel Uyoho a lot. Uyoho, I said it wrong that time. A lot. I mean. Nice slider, fastball, 96, really good arm. Veteran, junior college guy. I will tell you that Omaha last year um, skewed my thinking a little bit. Um, I was in the camp that I would really like to have a fourth starter built up through the midweek that you can count on in a regional if you get into the loser's bracket or in Omaha if you get in trouble. And I, I've always kind of thought that way, and LSU's never done it. Palmineri wanted to get everybody out there in the midweek, and Jay Johnson, I mean, didn't have any. He didn't have a third, yeah, yeah. He didn't have a third starter his first year, uh, and last year they didn't have a third starter really either. They were trying to shuffle things through there and, and figure out what would work. Fact of the matter is, you just need to have a lot of good pitchers. 
and maybe Griffin Herring or Nate Ackenhausen gives you what they did in Omaha, or maybe you just need to be able to get to the next guy. I mean, Javen Coleman was a star in that in that regional in Eugene, and that was really out of nowhere. I mean, that was not something you expected. So I don't need somebody that I, I hand the ball to in one of those situations that's not jump Holman or Hurd and say, hey, I need you to get me six innings. You need to have been doing that all year. No, if I, if I have to go into one of those games and say, hey, I need uh, Griffin Herring to start and give me three, and then Ackenhausen to give me two more, and then Gidry to give me two, and then I got you know Javen Coleman. Like it, you just need to have a lot of guys. I've, I'm off the build me up a midweek starter thing. It made sense in my head for a very long time, but the fact of the matter is, like you're just going to play a lot of innings. Everybody gets a little bit compromised up there now that they've compacted things, and you don't have as many days off. It, it shouldn't matter in a, in a super or throughout the course of the regular season, but in, 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 when you get into one of those tournaments, like. Just make sure you got a lot of dudes, and this team has a lot of dudes. I don't disagree with that. I mean, in a regional, you need three guys if you win every game. Yes. Super regional, sweep, oh, sweep the super regional. You've used two of your arms. Uh, the way the College World Series is set up now, just win. I mean, don't fall into the loser's bracket. And even if you do, and you're a special team like LSU, you can make it through. But that that's the thing. Teams aren't supposed to come through the loser's bracket. Like that, It's well, not that, designed that way. So well, you have to be special in order to do that, and LSU was. So I, I don't disagree with you on that. Ole Miss won the thing with two pitchers. Yeah, They won it with two starting pitchers. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think maybe that is a little outdated. Now, again, if you can do it, do it. I mean, yeah, if you can do because for if other, for if no other reason, then maybe that guy's ready to just step into a weekend role the next year uh, is, is how I look at it a bit more. But, yeah, but for a tournament, it, again, you're not supposed to come out of the loser's bracket. It's supposed to be a penalty. So you have to be special to do it, and they were. All right, um, we'll do a little bit on the schedule here. I'll give kind of my thoughts. LSU caught um, a, a nice break last year not playing Florida mm-hmm. in, in SEC play. That was obviously a very, very good team. Uh, we saw them in Omaha, and they were they were excellent. Um this year, you're drawing the big guns from the SEC East. You will play Florida, uh, you will play Vanderbilt, um, and you will play uh, Tennessee. Uh, so you've caught some really good ones out there from from the SEC East. Um, who do they miss from the East? They do they do play Missouri. They do not play Kentucky. They don't play South Carolina. They don't play South Carolina. And we'll see what they've got. And they don't play Georgia, right? Who I think is not going to be very good at all. Um, they got uh, Charlie Condon, who's great, and then I don't think they have much of anything after that. Uh, so it's it's a difficult schedule. I will break it out like this, and I really only put a lot of stock in the in the SEC games because I think your record in those games usually indicates where things are going to shake out. They need to tread water for five weeks. You start in Starkville. I don't think they're going to be good at all. You need to get two of those, and then you've got to tread water. Florida comes to the box. You go to Arkansas. Uh, you've got Vanderbilt at home at the box. You've got at Tennessee, and um, at that point, you've played five SEC weekends. Right now, Tennessee, Vanderbilt, and Florida are all in the top 10 preseason. So if they can find a way to get to the halfway point at 8-7, and 8-7 and seven, I would okay. be fine with. Because if you look at the back half, at Missouri, sorry, I don't trust them to be any good at all. Auburn at the box, that's always a series that I think you ought to be able to, to control. Auburn has been good late in years. Butch Thompson's a good coach. you got more talent than, than Auburn. Texas A&M comes in here. That's going to be a pretty good club. But you're at Alabama. I think they're going to be bad. You've got Ole Miss in the box. I don't think they're going to be very good. So I think it, if you can tread water through the first half, that you're going to be okay in the back half and you ought to be able to go somewhere in the neighborhood of like 10 and 5. And then if you go 8 and 7 and 10 and 5, you're talking about an 18 wins in the SEC. That's one short of where they were last year with one short game. And that should probably be enough to get you, get you a top eight. I always try for 20, but I'm just being realistic here. That's that's the the minimum that you need to do to get it done. The schedule is significantly more difficult in conference play than it was last year, and yet I still think it could be worse because if we're being honest, the SEC West is kind of down, and it hadn't been. I mean, it it was the superior league, and that was that's what made it so hard when you did draw Florida and Vanderbilt, and then you yeah. still had to play Ole Miss and Arkansas, and I mean, you know, On the Mississippi, road, Mississippi State. State, yeah, all that. It's not like that right now. So that helps. That's why you're able to have that front loaded and, and the back be a little bit uh, more, you know, e- I don't want to say easy because it's, it's the SEC. It's not. And it's baseball. It's not. But you you get what I mean. Uh, State. State was bad last year. They came to your building and beat you. Uh, yeah. And Auburn, that, well, I didn't think was great. And Auburn's not good. So, I mean, you know, yeah, that's like, it's going to be hard to go to Starkville still, even though they're probably not going to be good. When you look at that stretch that you talked about with Florida, Arkansas, Vandy, and Tennessee – 
win, win your home series. Getting mm -hmm. Florida stinks, but getting them at home is a break. Having to not go to Nashville, that's good. You're probably if, you're probably not going to win in Fayetteville. If we're, if we're being honest, if we're just being honest, probably not going to win in Knoxville. They play really, really well there. That ballpark's stupid, and <laughs> I mean it, it's it. But if you can split those, you're going to be in a really, really good spot. Just in general with your SEC record and with your strength of schedule as well, because those are going to be quality wins to hang your hat on. So yeah, I'm with you. I think eight and seven wouldn't be a bad spot uh, to to be. You just I think that'd put a little bit more pressure on you it would. If, if you were in, 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 if, if instead you were maybe like nine and six. I, I mean, uh, but nine and six, I'd be thrilled with. At yeah. That point. So I mean, that that's I would look at it right now and be like, win your home series in that stretch and. See if you can get one on the road. Just don't get swept. Just don't get swept in any of them. Anything that we missed here? I don't think we so. We got to say what we think is going to happen this year. But oh, well, I think they'll go to Omaha. I, I think I, the, season, like I think the season ends in Omaha. I, I, I'm not going to predict another dog pile, but I think this team, because of the starting pitching that it looks like they have, will make a run back to Omaha. You going to tell Moscona that AFR needs to be going to Omaha if they get there? Uh, yeah, but only if I can be included on the trip. Well, that's the point. Uh, <laughs> okay. I guess, I guess, the, yeah. I guess all uh, the buttons right. are right here. Yeah, all the so buttons that, are here. That's that the problem. That doesn't help. <laughs> if not, we'll send you and the Hunt Palmer show it's back up there. It's a bad deal yeah. because they're a, I caught so lucky last year because they never played at one. And I, my, <laughs> they always played at six. So it, it worked out so great. If they'd have gotten the loser's bracket more quickly, then they could start playing those one o'clock games. They never never got there. So we were we were fine. And then I went up there and lost my voice and tried to do a show from the Ameristar with no voice. But they won, so it was a lot of fun. Hopefully, they do it uh, do it again. We appreciate y'all hanging up, uh, hanging out with us. Musso, tell them they can find Musso at the box each and every day. Absolutely, Musso at the box. So first off, anywhere you get your podcast, uh, Apple, Spotify, Google, anywhere you get your podcast, it's there. Subscribe, like it. But YouTube channel this year, go to go to YouTube, type in Musso at the box. It's right there. Click the channel, click subscribe, hit the bell. You'll be notified every time a video drops. It's greatly appreciated. Like, share, spread the word. It's, Let's get it out there. Spreading pretty quickly as of right now. Baseball coming at you. We'll see you all at the box.